I'm told that your law clerks, when you were looking for a new one, you, um, of course, you checked all aspects of their background, but it was really important to you to find out where they went to high school. And I started with that. You know, that gives me a picture of, you know, where they live and who they are. And then from there, I'd, I'd ask him other questions, but yes. I think that's true of all the people who lived, back, local boys back in the old days, you know, where you went to high school. And if they said Kamehameha, okay, you got a picture of that. If they said St. Louis, they said Punahou, they said Iolani, they said uh, Farrington, uh, Kaimaki, you, you, you'd get a sort of a picture of flavor. So what did it say about you that you went to St. Louis? Well, that during school I had to wear a tie, <laughs> uh, you know, that it was a little stricter operation than other places, a little more uh, controlled, uh, that it was all boys, so you don't know anything about girls. Jim Burns has always called himself just a local boy. This despite the lofty trappings of his career, rising to chief judge of the State Intermediate Court of Appeals. And he's the son of one of the most consequential political leaders in Hawaii's modern history, Governor John Burns. Jim Burns, next on Long Story Short. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in high definition. Aloha mai kako. I'm Leslie Wilcox. James Stanton Seishiro Burns, better known as Jim Burns, retired chief judge of the Hawaii Intermediate Court of Appeals, was born in Honolulu in 1937 to a father who was a police officer and a mother who was partially paralyzed by polio two years before Jim was conceived. It wasn't until much later that Jim's father, the late Governor John A. Burns, became a politician and the driving force that brought the Democratic Party to power, changing Hawaii's political landscape forever. It was apparent in Jim's young life that there was something exceptional about his parents. When people talk about when they were born, it's you know just a fact. I, I was born on this date, but you, your story of birth is huge. I mean, I, I, I've never heard such a dramatic birth story as yours. I'd well, love to hear it from you. Well, I don't remember it. <laughs> I only know what they told me. Um, interesting story. Um, my mother had two children, and then while she was pregnant with the third during seventh month, she got polio. It, then called infantile paralysis, and uh, so the baby was born, my brother, and but he didn't live m long, and uh, so she was paralyzed at that time from the neck down, and uh, real bad, and subsequently, now this was 1935, but subsequently in 1936 she became pregnant with me, so, while she was paralyzed, and uh, you know. I don't know how much of the upper body then was paralyzed, but it, definitely from the lower body she was paralyzed. And uh, so all the doctors told her to abort. And they said they wouldn't treat her if she refused. And she says, no, I'm not going to abort. And uh, so really nobody wanted to treat her. So was she personally at risk? Is that why they oh, wanted her to abort? She, yes, paralyzed. Both of us were at risk, yes. And uh, she said, no. I won't. Fortunately, my father knew, knew a guy, a Japanese uh, body expert, I think you'd call him. He was a jiu-jitsu judo master. And uh, so my father found him. And of course, the doctors didn't want him to touch my mother, said he would kill her, you know, with what he was going to do. But no, my father went with him. And he took care of my mother during the pregnancy, all during the pregnancy. Um, you know, she said, um, Dumped him and dumped her into a bath water. Uh, what was it? Uh, seaweed water, and uh, etc. Massaged her, stretched her. Um, my mother said he almost killed me, but every time I would scream, he'd say, "Go ahead, scream some more." Well, now, uh, if she was paralyzed, I mean, you're, it's indicating that she's feeling pain. But would she feel pain? Oh yes. Oh, she did feel oh, pain. Oh gosh, yes, yes. She just couldn't move her body, but she could feel pain, yes. I see. 
I never talked to my father about it, but I did talk to her about it. You know, why, why would you get pregnant while you were paralyzed? And she said, I wanted to show that I could continue to be a wife, you know, that, that uh, I could be together with him. And uh, being good Catholics, uh, it happened. And, and you were born perfect? I, I was born healthy, almost eight pounds, um, full-term pregnancy. And, uh, and delivered by a, a friend who didn't deliver babies because there was no doctor to deliver me. Um, he was a doctor, but he was not a doctor who, who uh, specialized in that particular business. So I notice that you have a Japanese middle name. Yes, I do. And is that because of the, the man who helped your mom deliver? Yes, his name was Henry Seishiro Okazaki. Uh, quite, quite famous in uh, the community. And uh, after I was born, um, you know, my father talked to him, I guess, about, hey, what can I do for you? I gotta pay you, whatever. And the man said, you call him Seishiro. And that's, <clears throat> that's all my father ever called me. Jim Byrne's brother and sister were only a few years older than him, but by the time Jim came along, the family had gone through many changes. Jim's father had become a police officer, and he had moved his family from Kalihi to the windward side, Kailua, where Jim grew up. So you were the, the favored child, right? Because you were the, the young, youngest who, who'd come through so miraculously. Well, that's what my sister says. I'm not sure it's true, but I guess I had a better life than she did or my older brother did. But uh, Was your father, who was known as very strict and sometimes punitive, yes. uh, you had it easier than your, the older kids? Well, I don't know how they had it, but I know that I, I had some wax, some pretty good ones. So he was very strict with me also. But I think because I'm younger, he mellowed over the course of time. So I think they caught it more than me before he mellowed. You know, when your father was governor, um, people said, and this was sometimes quoted in the papers, uh, his, his nickname could be the Great Stone Face. He was very impassive and stern. What yes. was he like as a father? Same. Exactly. Yes, very. Not too many jokes. They both sound like very strong people. I mean, did you feel like you had room to breathe around them? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Well, you know, depending on what part of my life you're talking about, I didn't see him that often. Um, I saw my mother much more than him, and my mother was much easier to deal with than he was. And even your mother went away for a while for treatment, right? When I was two years old, she went to the mainland for treatment, uh, and she was there until Christmas of 42, um, actually should not have come back. She came back sooner than she should have, uh, but she was so homesick. Wow, and your dad so, was often gone as well. Uh, yes, so I didn't see her, you know, I wasn't conscious of her when I was two years old, and I didn't see her until I was uh, four and a half. Wow. Or actually, let's see, Christmas 40, I'm sorry, five and a half. Five and a half. Do you, remember, half do you remember seeing her um, you at know, five not, and a half? Well, I know that she came home. and uh, We had written, we had been writing to her while she was gone, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure my penmanship was not so good in those days, <laughs> but, but I would write notes to her. And, uh, Who took care of you? Well, that, that's a good question. I recall a lady uh, from down the street, a good family friend, who used to take care of all of us. My father's mother lived next door, but uh, lots of kids she took care of, and I remember her. And then uh, when we got older, I know my father got some gals from the detention home, um, the girls' home, and they came and babysat. Uh, so it was just whoever. Uh, and then it was wartime. Tell me about Pearl Harbor. Okay. Well, let's, let's go back a ways. Um, my father's a policeman, and uh, prior to the war, he's in charge of espionage. He's the chief of espionage of the police department. And I think the United States knew that it was going to get into a war with Japan. It, it had to, to get into the war in Europe. And so I think about 39, the chief asked my father to put together him and four guys to go check with the Japanese community 
and find any signs of disloyalty. So my father gathered together four other guys from the police department, three of whom uh, were Japanese and one was Hawaiian. Did your dad get to pick? Yes, he got to pick. So he picked the, the four. And uh, interesting story. I always tell this story, and it, it's true. Five people. Remember Hawaii Five-0? <laughs> That's where the five comes from. Uh, you know, that investigative unit. But anyway, the, so the five went out and checked all over the place and came back and said, no, no signs of disloyalty whatsoever within the community. We were at church Sunday morning, December 7th, 7 a.m. Church was finished and we we're just going to start going home. And we saw this blast explosions at uh, what was then the uh, Kaneohe Naval Air Station, which is now the Kaneohe Marine Station. And we could see planes and bombs and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, you know, I'm young. I'm only four and a half years old. Or, and, uh, you know, I'm just, all I know is that there's a ruckus going on, but he knew what was going on. So uh, he rushed home, ran into the house, picked up the phone, called, and uh, all I heard him was say, oh, four-letter word, and out the door he went, and I didn't see him for a long time. We didn't see him for a long, long time. Long time meaning how long? I, you know, I recalled two, three weeks, but he was gone. Um, and now we were at home. We didn't have my mother, um, you know, just had whoever was looking after us and thinking that we're going to be invaded. You know, and then martial law came, and et cetera. We lived under that. And right next door, uh, there was a military camp that they set up in the ironwood pine trees, uh, which was interesting. So part of my growing up was working with the soldiers, being with the soldiers. They were very nice to us. So very unconventional entry to the world and very unconventional upbringing. Yeah, I would say so. How do you think it affected you? Well, it made me very independent, that's for sure. Uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't have a lot of social contact other than my brother, sister, and whoever else was around. So I learned how to do my own thing. I know you went to St. Louis. I think it was called college at the time. St. Louis College. And, um, you, and you lived in Kailua. So yes. Polly Road was there. So but it, it was wasn't that hairpin. Road. It was the old Polly Road. With the hairpin turn. Yes. How did you get to school? That way. Um, in the morning, somebody took us. My father or somebody who was, lots of kids went to St. Louis Sacred Hearts in those days from Kailua. So somebody, whoever it was, took us to St. Louis. How'd you get home? Well, when I was younger, you know, somebody would pick us up. My father or somebody, he got to pick us up. But as I got older, um, the bus went to Nuuanu, dropped us off. Wow. Those days, the buses had electrical lines, wires. That's right. They were trolleys. They were yes, like trolleys. trolleys. So they, they didn't, Nuuanu was as far as they got. And then how did you get home from there? Hitchhike. Did you always find somebody to take yes, you? Yes, yes. Who was it usually? What kind of person? All kind, you know, all kinds of people, neighbors, yeah. friends, or, or just people. Um, you know, kind of was a small town, country town, and uh, everybody kind of knew each other, friendly with each other, um, different kinds of people. Um, but there was one man, an interesting story, a um, guy named Charlie Asada, and he drove the kerosene truck. And people say, kerosene truck? Well, yeah. those days, the farmers between the Pali and Kailua, talking along the Ko'olaus, uh, lots of Japanese farmers. And they didn't have electricity. So their source of power was kerosene. Mm -hmm. And so he would drive his kerosene truck, and he'd go fill up the tanks for all of these people. You know, different places, different days. And uh, so I went with him. and. Uh, People say, why did you do that? I say, well, number one, he was fun to be with. He was very uh, educational, entertaining, etc. But number two, while he was filling up the tanks, guess what we were doing? We were eating. I mean, those people had good food. <laughs> and so by the time I got home, I was full. There was a time when your father left uh, the police force yes. to become a full-time politician, and um, your mom started running a liquor store. Well, yeah. Initially, he ran it. Uh, so he was uh, he bought a, he bought a liquor store, and he was running it in Kailua. But then he got so involved in politics. Now we're talking about 46, 47, and then he ran in 48, 
And so then my mother started running it. And we live five blocks away. So we're talking a lady in a wheelchair um, going to the liquor store. And sometimes somebody took her, sometimes she wheeled herself, and sometimes I pushed her. Um, and she, she basically took charge of the purchases and the, the ordering was, and... She was there all day. Um, you know, I don't know how she did it, but she did. And when I could, I went and helped. As, as I got older, I did more and more help. But, you know, we, we had shelves and she couldn't reach. So the customer would just reach and mm. take whatever they wanted. And, you know, then they would make their purchase. Um, I thought that was an interesting choice of a type of business because hadn't your father previously had a problem with alcohol, alcohol and he'd stopped, but, but then he bought a liquor store? Well, his father was an alcoholic. And, and then deserted the family. And so I, he was a very angry man. I think my father grew up very, very angry and bothered. So he was incorrigible when he was young. And um, in fact, so much so that my mother couldn't handle him, sent him off to Fort Leavenworth to live with an uncle. Mm -hmm. um, and when he came back, he bounced around, finally became a policeman. But while he was a policeman, initially in the 30s, um, he, got, he got into an accident, had liquor on his breath. Now, nobody said he was drunk, but he had liquor on his breath, and apparently policemen weren't supposed to do that. So he was sanctioned for it. And I guess his mother sat him down, and uh, eventually he promised, okay, I'm not going to drink anymore. So he became... And he did. He quit cold turkey at some I point? I never saw the man drink. Amazing. No. And, and, and could handle the liquor store no problem. Yes, but he drank coffee <laughs> constantly. But yes... And then, as I say, my mother ran the store, and they ran it till uh, the early 50s, and then Piggly Wheelie came to Kailua and ran us out of business. <laughs> the old Piggly Wiggly. It was during Jim Burns' high school years that his father, John Burns, started becoming politically active. It would be many years before John Burns would win an election. But through his organizing activities, the elder Burns was laying the groundwork for what would become major social change in Hawaii. When you were a kid, here you are with a Japanese middle name. Uh, you're going to St. Louis. Um, and there, I bet you there weren't many Caucasian boys at St. Louis. Well, Caucasian, if you include Portuguese, there were plenty. <laughs> Yes, so I, you know, I was just as little, I don't think they, they knew whether I was Pori or Holly. I was just one of the local boys. I spoke pidgin and, and I, you know, associated with everybody. Yeah, that's um, true. If, if, uh, if I hear you and you're talking with your St. Louis buddies, I would never know what race you are. Yes, yes. So, yeah, no, we just mixed. And nobody ever said, hey, you and Holly. Uh, the only difficulty I had was my father was a loser as a politician. In the beginning? Uh, he lost from 46 to 56, 10 years. I went to high school, I went to college before he won an election. So he was all during my grade school, high school, he was a loser. And I used to catch heck for that. Why did people mind that your dad was losing political Well, because battles. he'd run for office and he'd, and he'd lose, and they would say, the hell is your father doing running for office, you know, losing? And in fact, even worse, um, they used to call him names. And I went home one time, I said, Daddy, what's a communist? And he said, why do you ask me that kind of question? And I said, well, that's what my classmates say you are. And uh, I, he never really answered the question. I had to go find out by myself. So all those years, his political aspirations and his, his, the ability he had in, in bringing people together, that was not a plus for you? I wasn't involved. No, all I knew is he was, he was involved with, with running for office or organizing the Democratic Party. Um, and I think he was on the other side of most of the kids that I was hanging around with. And, uh, you know, they were on the other side of the track. And so he was sort of a, an outsider in there. Everybody's wondering, what's he doing? Why is he over there? What do you mean, other side of the track? Well, the, the Republicans were totally in charge. So anybody who wasn't Republican was on the other side of the track. And it's true, at that time, the leaders in Hawaii tended to be 
Republican and Caucasian, but your dad was Caucasian, but from Kalihi and the son of a single mom who eked out an existence, and he, you know, he was, like you said, he was an angry, angry young man who, mm -hmm. I guess, uh, knew something about street gangs growing up. Well, yes. Number one, he grew up in Hawaii. Uh, grew up in Kalihi. He was very much a local boy. Again, he went to St. Louis. Um, so I don't think you'd call him a Howley. Um, same as me. Would he consider that fighting words? Probably, yes. So, so, so your dad really had a way different profile than any of the others. He was on the Democratic side, yes. and he was from an impoverished background. From the streets, yes, yes. I know he wasn't a man to sit you down for father-son talks, but did you get the sense of his passion for equal opportunity for everybody in a place that marginalized many ethnicities? Oh, yes. I mean, I mean I'd sit and listen when he had conversations with other people. Um, and, you know, I could get the sense of what he was talking about. Um, and uh, so I didn't have any difficulty understanding what was happening. I didn't know that uh, the Howley was in charge of everything, you know, but I did know that we couldn't be members of Wild Country Club. Uh, you know, I, there were certain things that I knew that they had but we didn't have. And I knew the difference between Pono and St. Louis. So, what is the difference? Well, in, in those days, it was more of the Howleys than, than St. Louis, which is more of the local people. Um, you know, I knew that difference. So you, you grew up with that sense of the local people are, are getting a bad shake, a bad uh, rap. I don't think I really realized it, other than through my father. You know, why is this man so committed to doing what he's doing? Um, you know, why isn't he out there um, working for the family kind of thing? Um, other than that, I don't think I thought about it. And, and you knew it wasn't getting him any traction while you were growing up because he wasn't yes. winning elections. Right, right. So I didn't think about it too much, but still you're, you're wondering, why is he doing what he's doing? When um, your friends at school would, or anybody would criticize your dad right. or say, th right. say things about him, did you feel proprietary and defensive? Or how, how did that make you feel? No, it just made me wonder. That's all. Uh, I didn't, you know, I didn't think there were fighting words. It, at St. Louis, every word was a fighting word if, if you took it that way. You know, if you were insulted, um, everybody talks stink about everybody, so uh, I sort of got used to it, and I got to be pretty good at it myself, so. I think during the course of his growing up, and especially as a policeman, he got to realize what kind of society Hawaii was, and he got to realize that this bunch of white folks were totally in charge of this place, and nobody else had an opportunity or a chance to do anything. He was at the police department one time, and uh, this uh, businessman, one of the big five people in control, picked up the phone and, and said, Governor, come to my office. And my father said, that's kind of backwards. You know, Governor, come to my office? Isn't the governor supposed to say, you come to, you know, and, but that's the way it was. Who was in charge? Who was in control? Um, and I, you know, and I guess he could see the prejudice against the, the local people, Filipinos, Japanese, Chinese, Koreans. And uh, he, he just eventually said, no, no, I, I'm going to do something to change this. I mean, totally committed himself. So quit the police department, which was sad because he loved the police department. He, he was... I, I say this to people, all his life he was truly a cop. In his heart, he was a policeman. He loved mm -hmm. it. And that's part of the problem with his family. You know, policemen is very tough on the family because they go to work and they get to see what's going on and they come home and say, I don't want you to be like that. You know, so they're very strict on you. And uh, did you ever talk to your mom about your father's political aspirations and what was he doing? Well, no, but I knew she was getting frustrated. Because she was working at the liquor store well, while he was well, organizing? She knew that he was doing what he was wanted to do, and she knew he was doing the right thing. So I think she supported him in that way. But on the other hand, I'm sure she said, hmm, I wish I had a little more family life. Um, and so did you, no doubt? Yeah, sort of. But, you know, I saw my father more, I think, than, than others. I used to caddy for him, and, you know, I spent time with him in the car. 
listening to him or time when he was running the liquor store or so you know I I associated with him and your mom looked at his um, time away from the family as something that he just had to do and she accepted it yes she was that was the kind of person she was you know same way she handled her paralysis it was that's the deck of cards that they dealt me and that's what I'm going to deal with you know and I'm not going to agonize over it or worry about it. And your dad was busy trying to change the world. And he was, yes, that he was doing, and my mother put up with it. Jim Burns was in college on the mainland by the time his father was finally elected to office as Hawaii's delegate to Congress in 1956. During his term, Hawaii became a state, and John Burns came home to run for governor. He lost his first two tries, but finally won in 1962, well after Jim had finished college and law school. Mahalo to Jim Burns for sharing his childhood memories with us and what it was like to grow up with a father who sacrificed so much, including time with his family, for his social and political ideals for Hawaii. And mahalo to you for joining us. For PBS Hawaii and Long Story Short, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Ahui ho. For audio and written transcripts of all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. To download free podcasts of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, go to the Apple iTunes Store or visit pbshawaii.org. You noted that that's you here, yes. cut off from view. Yes. And then there's another picture where you're also cut off and you're, you're wheeling your your mom and in a very important occasion. That's my day off from basic training uh, to go attend the inauguration and uh, I'm in my uniform and I'm behind her and, and pushing her and nobody had a clue who, who I was. You know, they just thought I was a soldier pushing Mrs. Burns. Uh, local people said unidentified soldier. They, they didn't know that I was related to them.